Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. PlenAirMagazine.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by PaintingFromNature.com a website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. Paintingfromnature.com Early stories out of the American West told of a place where the earth erupted fire and the rivers flowed with boiling water and steam. In early June, 1871, a team of 34 men and seven wagons began a journey of discovery. Led by Ferdinand Hayden, the expedition set out from Ogden, Utah to find the truth behind the legends. Among the group were two artists, Thomas Moran, a landscape painter, and a photographer named Harry Jackson. Their job was to visualize the mythical land that they were about to experience. Their work became proof that the stories were true. I'm Stefan Bauman, and welcome to The Grand View. Few words in the American language can stir up the imagination like the Yellowstone National Park. This park was the first national park, and it was partially due to the efforts of Thomas Moran and Harry Jackson that this place was set aside for future generations. This place is not only known for its abundant wildlife, but for the unusual landscape it has to offer. So come along with me as we explore this fascinating place and America's first national park, Yellowstone. When a geyser is predictable, that is the anomaly. That's the very unusual thing. In fact, Old Faithful being the most predictable geyser in the world uh, is almost stunning scientifically. We don't know why it's so predictable. Usually, if you can predict a geyser to within even a few days, that's fantastic. So the, again, the unusual nature of Old Faithful uh, needs to be conveyed and that it's not the way everything works. The, uh, the chemistry of Yellowstone's hydrothermal waters are, are very fascinating because they are derived from a cooling rock body. Uh, molten rock underground is called magma. We do have magma in this area. And as that magma cools, it gives off water and a lot of uh, very interesting uh, uh, chemical constituents. Now what you actually are primarily seeing at most of the geyser basins in Yellowstone is silica. Uh, geysers deposit sinter. Uh, it's just a general term for uh, materials deposited from geysers. And you can have siliceous sinter formed of silica like beach sand or you can have uh, calcium carbonate or travertine. 
The deposits can be everything from flat aprons to cones to uh, uh, geyserite forms, which are more like little marbles, bulbous masses that are in the, the splash areas. So there are many different types of forms or morphologies that exist depending on the exact chemistry, temperatures, wind patterns, all sorts of things. Out in the northern range, which is uh, some of the more productive uh, animal range, we've, we've had um, uh, glaciers that have carved out wide valleys and also uh, created uh, glacially dam lakes that deposited uh, rich sediments in these valleys. And those tend to be in the Absorca volcanics, which are more iron rich, erode easier than these rhyolite um, Yellowstone volcanics, and so a much lusher vegetation. So the geology, as it is everywhere, um, is an underpinning for the whole ecological system. The natural system will evolve, and, and especially when you're dealing with the volcanic system this large, nature will always win. Yellowstone became the world's first national park in 1872, um, and prior to it being established, um, there had been a lot of native peoples living in the area, a lot of fur trappers coming in the area, um, and there were some amazing tall tales coming out of the Yellowstone region. For instance, there's a creek in Yellowstone called Alum Creek, and alum kind of makes things shrivel up like your mouth if you get it in your mouth. There were tales that people that would take their uh, Horses across Alum Creek would actually have the horses turn into ponies overnight because they would shrink. So finally, some citizens got together and decided that they wanted to actually see what was here. And a series of expeditions started into the park. Um, the first one was in 1869, and then there was another one in 1870, the washburn langford Doan expedition that really came back with some hard evidence of the wonders that were in Yellowstone that existed. The one thing I found is that if you're willing to get off the trails, or excuse me, get off the road just a little bit, um, get onto a trail, maybe hike just a half mile down a backcountry trail, find a nice tree to sit under, you have Yellowstone all to yourself. There really is a lot of diversity in the park. Yellowstone is very cold for a lot of the year. I mean, we have eight or nine win winters, depending on where you are. So you have everything from almost a desert down near the north entrance of the park, where there's cactus growing, all the way up to alpine tundra, where the flowers you have to lay on your belly to be able to really see. Um, we also have a lot of plants that are specialized to just live around the thermal areas in Yellowstone. There's a kind of uh, grass called the Ross's bent grass that exists only in a very small area around the thermal basins. It wouldn't be able to live if the geysers weren't here. Uh, but in terms of the larger animals we have here, we have maybe 20,000 elk in the park and they are just in huge herd sometimes. Right now it's the mating season so the bull elk are even walking around the buildings and mammoth bugling. Um, trying to get their harems of females, their groups of females together to mate with them. We also have an incredible number of bison, and Yellowstone was the last refuge for bison back when they were hunted to almost extinction back in the late 1800s. Uh, there were 26 that were left in Yellowstone National Park, and from that, our, uh, just about our entire herd um, has kind of grown back to a, a pretty manageable size. I think the most special thing about Yellowstone is it really was the beginning of maybe the world's best idea. Yellowstone stood right there at the forefront when national parks were being considered when they were being created, and it really was the first area that was protected as a national park in the world. So for that, I think it's very special. mythology, according to our mythology, we have a, a, a mythological person named, called the Son of the Sun. They said he was a child of, of a crow woman and the sun. And uh, the sun took, took the lady up to, up to the skies. 
and married her. And, and after the, the child was born, the lady got lonesome and the child wanted to leave. He, was, he, did, he didn't feel at home where the son lived. So he sent him down. He, he made the woman, he killed seven buffalo bulls and made the woman make a, make a robe out of sinew. And uh, there were some places, to, he, he told her to get all the sinew in the buffalo. And the woman didn't know that there were sinews in the neck of buffalo bulls. So he left those out and the rope was not long enough to reach the earth. So they were dangling in space and, and the son threw a rock down. And before he threw it down, he asked the rock to uh, kill the woman, but to safely land a child. And so that was the son of the son. And in our, our, uh, our uh, Genesis stories on the beginning of, of man and the earth, they say that the sun came down and created the earth and all the animals and plants and everything. And, uh, and, and after he created everything on the earth, he, he, uh, he went to the uh, Red Hill near the Yellowstone River and created the first man, the first Crow Indian. And he created you know, the red dust from the hill, from the mountain. And, uh, and he, he, uh, the first man was created red earth after the dust, after the dust that he was made out of. And uh, we, the only place that fits this description is in the Yellowstone River. We believe that all animals, uh, everything in nature had special powers that they could be bestow on people if they fasted. Or sometimes, even when they they didn't fast, these special powers would come to them. And a lot of our uh, what they call medicine bundles are are from the bear. The bear is a powerful uh, uh, creature that that helps you at war time. Well, we're at Yellowstone Falls, and I've got to say that even before we started to come to Yellowstone Park, I knew this was the place that we were gonna paint. This is red rock, and you actually have to hike down. And the reason why I'm so excited about this place, this is the actual place that Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran painted. So I knew that it would make for a perfect composition. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now this time, I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna sketch the entire painting with blue. Again, this is just a sketch. Very quickly, we're going to sketch this pretty fast. I want to get painting pretty fast because I'm so excited about being up here that I'm going to do this a little differently. Rather than sketch everything in detail, I'm going to just sketch the main masses. And then there's a row of pine trees and a little bit of a mountain. Now this area in here, it's all gonna be in shadow. It's gonna actually frame my painting. So I'm gonna very quickly, I'm gonna put a very quick wash of cobalt blue. With the burnt sienna, it will create a nice dark frame. And these trees are gonna grow off of this dark area. Now to the right, there's these wonderful Gothic spires that come up out of these wonderful angles. So let's put one of those in. It's a little obstructive from where I'm at, so I'm actually gonna remove the tree that's in front and bring it out into my painting just all by itself. And we're ready to start painting. We're gonna have just a little bit of sky showing through. This is just cobalt blue and white. Okay, now with my sky done, we're gonna start working on the next row of mountains. These mountains are fairly close, so that we don't have to worry about a real soft value. These trees are far away, and there's just a real soft edge. I'm gonna take exactly the same color, even with less white, and I'm going to put the next row of trees in. These trees should appear even darker than the ones that I just put in. So we create three rows of trees in a matter of seconds. And while I'm at it, I'm just gonna bring a little bit of this detail along the 
ridge of my mountain right against that sky, just to soften that edge even more. You want soft edges on the area of your painting that is not really the focal point, so that the viewer doesn't concentrate on it. And now with this base color, we're just gonna lay this all over the background rock, very quickly. And as we go down, there's a little bit of that light showing through. And then we're gonna bring it back up on these rocks here. Okay, now with this base color in, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna manipulate it back and forth. In the shadow areas, I'm gonna add a little bit more blue and red to create a little purple. And in my highlight areas, I'm gonna to try to put it on a little purer. The canvas tone is actually going to enhance this color because it, in some areas, I'll leave it a little bit transparent, especially in the shadow area. I do want some of this brown tone to show. And just mixing these two colors back and forth. Now, there's a lot of shadow in this rock here that goes all the way up to the top of the rock. And so I'm gonna take this purplish color and I'm just going to bring that right along my highlight color. Enjoy the fact that the light is changing because you're learning about this area. You're seeing things that all of a sudden just appear out of nowhere and then disappear while something else pops up. Okay, now I'm excited because I'm ready to start my water. Just begin by laying in the white. Now with a little bit of blue, I'm gonna start laying in my shadow color. And I'm gonna concentrate on this wonderful mist at this point. We don't even see the waterfall at the base. It just becomes this haze of wonderful, wonderful blue, misty color. And we're gonna bring this mist right along the shadow side of my waterfall. I'm bringing in the shadow. And I'm just gonna mix that also into my falls. And I'm going to bring that into my base color of the rest of my falls. I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow in with my white. And using the same stroke that I used with my shadow by going across, I'm gonna start bringing in the highlights of my water. There's a lot of wonderful spray. So I wanna create a nice misty quality over on this side. There's a little green showing at the very ridge of my waterfall. So I'm gonna to switch to a smaller brush, add Viridian Green and White, and I'm just gonna go right at the very edge of the waterfall and put that in. Okay, now with that dark color that I used for my river, also go ahead and bring it along the edge. What I'm gonna do is lay in the base for my darks and then I'm gonna bring the white back up to this. There's a definite ridge along the top of the waterfall that is very much the characteristics of these falls. I'm gonna introduce a little bit of darks into my waterfall because there's definitely some dark areas. And I'm gonna go back and forth, just working with my small brush. Notice these horizontal lines. By going horizontal, I can create that feeling of movement in my water. Beginning students oftentimes try to do waterfalls just to like bring the brush stroke flat. The water actually has a very horizontal feeling to it. It comes down in big clumps. Now I'm gonna lay the base color for my rocks. And notice I've gone over my sketch a little bit. I'm probably gonna push these rocks a little bit more to the left. Don't be married to your sketch. Be always willing to change it ever so slightly. And now I'm gonna to go to the right and also lay this base color in. The sun hasn't hit down here yet, so it's all in shadow. And while it's in shadow, I'm gonna paint it in shadow. I have to paint very quickly. And while I have this same tone on my brush, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of Viridian Green to it. Again, Viridian green is the same color that we used on the top of the waterfall. And I'm gonna paint in the base for my river. And now I'm gonna add just a little bit of white and blue. I'm gonna go create the mist. And I'm just gonna mix it into my base color. Now I'm just gonna mix in my mist into this base color. 
And I'm gonna do the same thing on this side too. Once I get the blue mist in, I'm gonna very carefully just work the edge, creating a darker value as it comes closer. These mountains will get the feeling that they are coming closer just by putting a little less white into these colors and mixing into my base color. See, so that base color becomes a very important part. And now let's start working on the main spire here. And I'm taking the mother color, and I didn't even switch brushes here. I've got the same brush that I used for my green. And I've got a little bit of green in my, in my color, and that's okay, that's okay. These rocks have all kinds of color in them. And just bring this all the way down into the canyon. Introduce a little bit more red and yellow down here. There's a little more uh, iron in the, the ground down here, so it has a little bit more of a brown, rusty color. And now with all my metal area more or less in, I can't wait to get to the foreground. So I'm gonna mix my alizarin crimson, my cobalt blue. I'm gonna make my background color into my foreground color just by adding some shadow. Just by bringing some dark in the foreground, creates the illusion that the background becomes the foreground. And now with my foreground darks and I'm gonna start working on my trees. I'm gonna to switch to a smaller brush and I'm gonna add lots of turpentine and I'm going to use the same two colors, and I'm going to lay in the trunks for my trees. So at the base of it, we do need to have a little bit more detail, but up here we can just kind of be loose. There's some little twigs and sticks sticking off that from trees that didn't quite make it. Okay, now since we finished our left-hand side of our painting, I wanna to go to the right-hand side and finish that. I'm gonna paint this fairly flat. This is gonna be my mother color for this particular rock formation here. And I'm going to mix in a darker color and lay in the shadow. And you can see very quickly, you can recreate these things without going into a lot of detail. Okay, now I'm going to pull a little bit of this color from this rock formation and I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to lay in the shadow for this formation. So I'm borrowing a little from this rock to paint that rock. Also, there's a, some little tiny trees in the background. So what we want to do is we want to very lightly just hit the fan brush onto this wet paint and create little tiny trees on the background mountains. Just with the hit of the fan brush. Okay, now with my trees done, I need to put a little bit of detail onto my rocks. I'm gonna switch to my flat bristle brush. I'm going to mix a cool color because most of these rocks are in shadow. And I'm just very quickly gonna add a reflected light on these rocks. Now notice the blue. Now in close-up this seems very, very bright, but in contrast to the rest of the painting, this is cool and it's actually dark. Okay, now I want to put in a few little bushes so this can just give the illusion of bushes and, and shrubs. Now with that done, we're ready to sign the painting. So I'm going to switch to my small signature brush. And we're going to conclude this wonderful day at Yellowstone. Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at the Grandview by calling 1-800-511-1337.
Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject. Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com And by Masterpiece Canvas Makers of fine art canvases We supply the canvas You supply the vision And by Plein Air Magazine for people who love painting outdoors. Plein Air Magazine.com